Cassia Faye Hayden. Welcome to my channel. Um, I typically do these videos on Saturdays instead of on Sundays, but I've been trying to get to remember where I was at in the book to um, to get one out to you for so long now that I don't even care that it's a day late. I'm sure you guys don't care either. Um, it's just about time that I got one out. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we are still in chapter two of, um, let me pull the book out and remember what the heck it's called. Um, change your mind, change your life concepts and attitudinal healing by Gerald G. Jambalski, MD and Diane V. Siricone. Um, I'll let you guys see the title page. If you can see it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So we're getting, we're finally getting back to our positive thinking videos. Finally. Finally. <sighs> because I had a reminder in my, in my to-do list to, to get one done for you guys. And every time I, I want to do one, uh, um, something something has happened like my phone would die or um i'd forget and now finally i remember and i'm like you know what just get it done it's not saturday it's a day after saturday who cares no one's gonna care that it's a day late people are probably gonna be like damn it's about time <laughs> so anyway finally back to this book um we are still in chapter two and we are at loss and grief a chance to heal and grow all right Teresa Spencer uh, Teresa Spencer Plain a dear friend of ours lives in uh, Australia you know what I'm gonna use my bookmark she has written the following piece entitled grief is for sharing a chance to heal and grow uh, ex uh, exerted from her own book, Time to Come Home, A Guide for Families Living with Dying. Because we have found it to be so extremely helpful to others, we would like to share some of its own wisdom with you. The following comprises her thoughts, which we have edited in some areas, hopefully without changing her, or her original intent. Grief is for sharing. What does the grieving person need to know what does he or she have uh, to be able to do to work through the pain and uh, chaotic emotions that accompany the death of a loved one to begin we need to know that grief is a normal and natural response to loss it is part of the human experience grief represents our humanness as does our love the death of a loved one is a universal experience and its occurrence initiates a painful process from grief to healing. It is an un, uh, unstable process too. A lonely journey cater, uh, cater, characterized by self doubts and intense emotions. The first weeks. During the first few weeks and months, you may feel you are living your life in slow motion. You may feel numb, detached from life, and unable to concentrate. Life is happening for others, but you may not feel part of it. You may feel that you have lost part of yourself. You feel dis uh, disorganized, and you may cry a lot. The sadness is overwhelming, and you sigh frequently. Some people may feel they have to be strong and fight back tears others feel that if they start to cry they may never stop you may be very angry angry at god how could god do this there is no god angry at the world and those around you angry at yourself and even angry with the person who has died how dare they die leaving you so alone loneliness is one of the biggest problems 
of grief. One feels abandoned and powerless. <laughs> Irrational guilt can sweep over you. Some may even feel a personal responsibility for the death. Many find their grief to be exhausting. You feel tire tired all the time. Sleep is difficult. Either we don't sleep or sleep is disturbed by vivid dreams and nightmares. While they may be uh, dis uh, distre distressing and indeed on, on occasions terrifying, in most cases these dreams will fade away in time. You may find yourself talking to the dead person as if she or he was present. You come home from the supermarket and find you have uh, bought a bottle of his usual shampoo or his favorite fruit juice. You may think you hear the dead person coming in the door and call out, I'm in the kitchen. Then realize no one is there and the person will never walk through the door again. I've been through that. I still talk to my grandma. I mean, it's been years. I mean, over a decade it's been. Um, she passed away in 2004, and I still, I still feel her. I still talk to her. Um, I know she's with me, and I know she's with me because she loves me and wants me to be happy and be at peace and wants to reassure me that it's okay to be happy and at peace. So, you know, it does, it comforts me when I feel her presence or when I talk to her and I cry, you know, talking to her and missing her. And, you know, sometimes when you love someone that much, sometimes it, the pain and missing them never fully goes away. It just gets easier with time. You know, you just got to take it one day at a time and you know, let the, let the grief sub subside little by little by little every day and make it, make every day just a little bit easier, a little bit, um, more able to move on and live your life and just do what you have to do to, to function and keep going, you know, unfortunately that's, that's just how it is. You just got to keep going. Um, and it's hard. And sometimes it's scary. And it's sad. And like I said, sometimes you never stop missing them. But you just got to keep going. Fake it until you make it, you know? And some days you will still stop and think about them. And cry over them. And miss them. All over again like it just happened. But... You're able to deal with it faster and recover from it faster and um, move back on with your day and and knowing that they're watching over you and that they want you to be happy and they want you to keep going. You know, just work work with your grief and let it subside. And the time that it needs to subside you know everything takes its own time and no one can tell you how much time you need to heal or grieve it's different for everybody so just do your best every day one day at a time one step at a time but anyway back to the book <laughs> If you swallow your grief, the proverbial lump in the throat will only surface later in the physical symptoms of insomnia, headaches, and gastrointestinal problems. Left alone. Some friends and even family members may not come to visit you after the funeral. They can often feel uncomfortable with your tears and intense emotions, and perhaps they don't know what to say. Others erroneously believe that their job is to distract you from your grief. Talk about feelings. Most grieving people need to speak about their feelings of grief, the loneliness, sadness, and depression, and tell their story to make living more tolerable. Talking about your loss in reality will help you to heal and work through the process of grief. 
So try and find people who will listen to you and help you feel understood and not alone. In discussing grief, it is important for each of us to remember we accumulate uh, our losses. Every loss uh, we ever encountered and suffered in our lives, if it has not been dealt with, is still with us. We are still carrying them. Time alone does not heal. It is what you do with your grief that brings healing. It is important to remember that the length of time you grieve is not a sign of weakness. Each person will be unique in this respect. Understanding your grief. The full sense of the loss of someone loved never occurs all at once. The birthdays, the wedding anniversaries, and the first anniversary of the death often makes you realize how much your life has been changed by the loss. You have every right to have feelings of emptiness, sadness, despair, even guilt and anger. You may be frightened by the depth of emotion felt at these times. Unfortunately, many people surrounding you may try to take these feelings away to get your mind off your loss. But most people who have suffered a great loss need to speak about their feelings, the emptiness, sadness, and depression they are feeling. There are many books that are helpful to those facing their own death or the death of a loved one, and there are many that discuss ways of dealing with loss and grief. However, these are all highly individualized processes, intensely unique for each of us. They are all processes we need to discover for ourselves. We uh, believe there is no way to uh, prescribe how to die, how to live, or even how to grieve. However, we have often found that for those seeking their own way, it can be helpful to hear the experiences of the many people who have come uh, to the create uh, to the center, who were guided by their desire to find answers for some of the same questions. At the Center for Attitudinal Healing, we have weekly group uh, meetings on loss and grief for those people who want to process their feelings. Every month, we also have an all-day session on the same sub subject, providing people with a safe environment uh, for sharing their individual experiences. People taking part in these groups attempt to listen without judgment to others' experiences uh, and uh, to offer their support. We would like to share some of the experiences we have had with people who have come to these meetings. Many uh, were people who were facing their own deaths while others were dealing with uh, loss and grief. And of course, there have been a great many people at the center who were doing both, facing their own deaths as well as grieving the loss of a friend they had met at the center. The pain and agony of mourning. Many people have come to our center who were unable to feel the full impact of their grief at the time their loved ones died. Many of them had obtained tranquilizers from their physicians to ward off the impact of the pain they were feeling at the time. After taking part in the loss and grief meetings, many of those people felt that it would have been much better not to have been on medication. They felt that the drugs robbed them of the opportunity to explore and feel their own grief. After openly expressing their feelings in the safe setting these meetings offered, they emphasized the importance of going through their feelings about a loved one's death rather than covering these feelings up. What most people discover is that regardless of the tranquilizer, or the uh, or other drugs in uh, drug involved the feelings of grief anger rage loss and deep sadness do not go away they just get hidden away 
in their subconscious minds for a while, only to surface again at a later time, all mixed together in a very confusing way with other events and issues in their lives. So many people have said uh, that had they gone through the pain and agony of their own mourning process at the time of their loved one's death, it would have been extraordinarily helpful. It would have helped them uh, climb another notch of their uh, own learning ladder, allowing them to discover for themselves a little more about the mystery of life and death. Many people talk about how important it has been for them to have a place where they can honor their human feelings and not feel that someone is judging them, criticizing them, trying to change them, trying to talk them out of what they are feeling or thinking they are crazy or acting in a certain way. Groups like the ones we describe provide that. One woman, for example, whose husband died suddenly in his sleep, continued to keep the same sheets on the bed for over a month before washing them. After sharing this with the group, she felt relieved when other people told her that they had done the same thing. It was helpful for her to know that there, was, uh, there are no right or wrong ways to express one's grief. People in the center's support groups find that there are there is great value in being able to share with others who are going through the same things and to learn that you are not alone. This sharing helps take the fear away. There are people who have identified with their grief so strongly that they think that their grief defines them. Talking with others helps to uh, helps them to be able to look at themselves differently. One uh, thing that needs to be emphasized is that the center offers people hope and that it gives them another way of looking at life, another way of looking at death, and gives them an opportunity to process their own pain and anger and grief so that they can ultimately learn from the experiences and heal. Today, there uh, are support groups of this kind in many cities throughout the United States and, and in other countries as well, all offering support in the grieving process. <sighs> I gotta admit, I went through the same thing. Um, when my grandma passed away, um, I had been highly medicated, not for my grief, but highly medicated, um, against my will. And it was actually medication that I really didn't need. And it was actually making me more mentally ill than it was. It was supposed to, um, heal my, my PTSD, but I was misdiagnosed with bipolar instead of PTSD and ADHD. So I was given medication that actually made me more mentally unstable, causing um, a uh, um, chemical imbalance in my brain that I didn't have before. Because if you take bipolar medication when you're not bipolar, it causes bipolar. So <laughs> um, it made me bipolar. So not only did, did the medication not help with my PTSD and my ADHD it, uh, <laughs> and made it, actually made it worse, um, it completely screwed me up when, it came, when I needed, most needed to, to grieve my grandma. Um, I lost her and then uh, right around the time that I lost her, my boyfriend at the time, who I was engaged to and had, um, yeah, he was, he was my first everything. So, um, <laughs> I lost him just before I lost her, um, and I was not dealing well. And, um, and even though I was on the medication before that, which is, part of the reason why he left um part of the reason why he left also was because um 
he wanted to go screw around with somebody else <laughs> and then come back and try to get me back afterwards. Yeah. Nice guy, right? That's why I'm not with him anymore. He was, um, he was a serial cheater and very mentally abusive. And, um, he came really close to becoming physically abusive and he was also very sexually abusive. So yeah, good reasons why he's not around anymore. But anyway, um, I didn't know at the time that, that he was bad for my mental health. So it kind of broke me, you know, having my first break up with me like that and rip my ring off my finger and chuck it into the river, um, broke me a little bit. And then on top of it, my grandma passed away and on medication that was making me literally crazy. So, um, I, I get it. You know, I have to agree that being on medication um, when you're grieving is not helpful. Unless you're on medication that you actually need to be on for um, a mental health issue prior to grieving that is actually helping you prior to grieving, um, don't stop taking that. <laughs> <laughs> if it's good for you before the grieving, it's still going to be good for you during the grieving. Um, don't stop taking your medications that, that help you. But like I said, I, I knew I was misdiagnosed with bipolar. I knew what I had wrong with me. Um, but the doctor didn't care. He didn't want to listen to me. The only person he listened to was my mom. And she wanted me misdiagnosed because she wanted the pills to shut me up basically. Um, the only medication I should be on is ADHD meds, which I've been trying to get on for over a decade now, and I'm still trying, and I'm still struggling to get on them, <laughs> which is why I can't shut up. <laughs> why my videos are intended to be very short, but end up being the longest videos I've ever seen on YouTube. <laughs> and I'm sorry about that, guys. It's, it's not intentional. But, um, I just, I can't help it. I just can't shut up. But <laughs> if I was on ADHD meds, then I'd be able to shut up. I would. I know I would. It would help. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, yeah, if you're, if you're put on meds specifically to, um, deal with loss, don't take them. Because, you know, they just, they mask it and they hide it and they don't really help. Now, right now, because I have, when I have uh, panic attacks, my panic attacks are so se severe because I also have fibromyalgia. And so when I have panic attacks, my panic attacks don't just affect me mentally, but they affect me physically and I could end up in the ER. So when I have issues where... Um, where I'm not able to deal with things, I have to take something in order to calm down so that I don't end up with physical issues from the panic attacks. Like I have seizures, I have mini strokes, I have all kinds of medical issues that happen from my panic attacks. So if that's a situation, um, then yes, definitely take something for anxiety to calm yourself down in order to make sure that you don't end up in the hospital. But if it's just a grieving issue, you know, just find someone to talk to that can help you, um, that, that can talk to you about it without being patronizing about it or without trying to um, change, uh, uh, get your mind off of it, you know. And um, don't take anything for anxiety that you can get from a mental health professional because that stuff is way too strong and it will subside, uh, suppress your emotions to the point where you can't grieve. Um, the kind of, the kind of meds that you would want would be, uh, over the counter, like magnesium, um, and L-thionine, uh, is what, which is what I'm using right now to deal with my panic attacks. Um, I don't re uh, recommend taking anything stronger than that um, when when you're just dealing with grieving. So I mean, only take something like that if it's if it's so severe that it's affecting you physically. <laughs> uh, 
okay? Uh, let's deal with our grief naturally in a proper way that is not going to make us more sick or not um, hide our, our emotions to the point where we're still grieving over it and dealing with it years from now um, to an extent that, you know, we need help. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to share my experience with that too so I could uh, explain that, yeah, I mean... They're right. It it doesn't help to to suppress your emotions when you're grieving um, with medication. It doesn't. And the severity of the medications I was taking, it did way more than just suppress my emotions. It messed me up totally for years. <laughs> but anyway, um, back to the book. <laughs> and if you guys are wondering about my bookmark, um, this site is a bookmark that I got. I think from Barnes and Noble several years ago. It's actually got real flowers in it. Um, and like crinkled paper. It's really pretty. And then the other side is a Vea's face. And that a beautiful face right there. That's my that's my daughter. Isn't she gorgeous? I am noticing that she has the same squinty eye problem that I do. It might be a thing with people who wear glasses. It might be. But, yep, her eyes are pretty squinty looking. Isn't she beautiful? She's a beautiful girl. That's my girl. I made that. I made that girl. I made her with my love. Yep, I made her. Anyway... Moving on. <laughs> ah, letting go of the fear of death. Man, it is a lot about death today. It's kind of sad. Melancholy. Although we have no pet formulas for letting go of the fear of death, there are a number of things we observed with those who have let go of their fear we would like to share some of these observations with you one thing they all seem to have in common was a willingness to question and reevaluate their old belief systems not to have them cast in in concrete or to attempt to discredit new experiences because they don't didn't fit neatly into their old reality the best way that we could think of to communicate the insights uh, that grew out of the loss and grief workshops was to interview people and ask them to tell their stories in their own words. Here are their stories. Patsy Robinson. Patsy is one of the founders of the center and has been associated with it since 1975. Wow, that's before I was even born. That was like a whole, literally in exactly a decade before I was born. Exactly. 85. I was born in 85. I'm an old fart. But anyway, um, her story illustrates the importance of dealing with our fears of death and giving ourselves permission to experience those feelings in a more complete way. She teaches us that when we do this, we open the doors for fully recognizing that our true identity is a spiritual one. And this realization releases us from the fear of our physical death. Patsy has worked in every capacity at the center from volunteer to president of the board so we felt that she would be an excellent person to interview she told us as i look back i realized that before we started the center i used denial to deal with my fear of death it was not until i started helping others around their loss and grief that i discovered that i had hidden not uh, and not really dealt with my father's death which had occurred years before 
I was helping facilitate a loss of grief, grief workshop when all of a sudden unstoppable tears began to come out of me. The very people whom I thought I was there to help began to help me. I think that what happened to me perhaps to many others as you are listening to other people go through the pain of their grief and sense of loss, you often discover your own grief. Patsy said that the person that impressed her most since she had been at the center was Joe Brewer, who had died of a brain tumor a number of years before. She said, I remember the first night that Joe came to our meeting. He said that he had recently gone to a physician who diagnosed him as having an inoperable, inoperable brain tumor. Joe's doctor told him he had only about two months to live. When Joe heard this, he told us, yeah, I fired him, and yeah, I did not want to go to a doctor with uh, that little optimism. Joe lived for another three years. During that time, he spent almost all his time helping others and learning to stay in the present. He really demonstrated to others, including me, that when you concentrate on living in the present, the quality of your life is the highest. He taught us the uh, tremendous value of so strongly living in the present that it becomes your only reality. The fear that he had uh, when he first came to the center disappeared, and he developed a wonderful sense of peace that he was generously able to share with others. Often it seemed to me that when people develop a catastrophic il illness, it gives them an opportunity to look at their life, to reevaluate their purpose and what they feel life is all about. For many, it seems to be a wake-up call for beginning one's own spiritual path. And it seems to me that we ought to be able to hear that wake-up call without having to face a catastrophic illness. It is hard to put into words the many wonderful experiences I have had. What I can say is that I have had many wonderful teachers who have faced their own death or who have faced the death of a dear one. For myself, perhaps the most important thing I have learned is that death is okay and I would, and I know in the center of my being that I am more than a body and that it is my spiritual self that is real. The experiences at the center have helped me let go of my old fears for which I am forever grateful. Cheryl Daniels Shohan. Cheryl's story is important to us because it is such a clear lesson in how spiritual transformation can unfold from even the deepest grief uh, confirming our true essence uh, as love. Cheryl is a woman who experienced a very deep and grievous loss, deeper than any of us will probably ever know. Her story demonstrates how we can heal ourselves by uh, helping and grieving uh, and giving to others, even when we have suffered the kind of pain that Cheryl has suffered. Cheryl was raised in the Jewish faith, uh, Jewish faith and she remembers feeling as a teenager that when you die, that is the end of life. She held that belief for many years. Sherry, uh, Cheryl married and had a daughter whom she uh, and her husband named Kamala. A few years later, she uh, had a second child whom they named Tajin. When Kamala was nine years old, she was diagnosed as having bone cancer. After radiation treatment and chemotherapy, she got better. Three years after that, Kamala's brother, Tajin, uh, was diagnosed as having a plastic carcinoma. A plastic carcinoma. Sorry, took me a minute to sound that out. Um... He died four months later. Cheryl and her husband, Paul, went through pain, despair, and agony that 
few of us could even imagine. I know I couldn't. They had felt deep depressed, uh, deeply depressed and angry with God after uh, Tajin died. They felt that they were victims and that the whole universe had turned against them. It was then when they felt that they could not endure any more pain that Kamala became ill again. Oh my God. Doctors diagnosed her as having uh, radiation-induced osteosarcoma. At the age of 13 years, almost exactly a year after Tajin's death, Kamala also died. Oh my God, those poor people. I mean, one child. One child is hard enough. I can't even imagine losing Avea. But two children? One right after, oh my God. Oh my God, that's, that's so horrible. It's so sad. I can't even imagine how they must have felt. Cheryl tells how following Kamala's death, she felt that both her children were present. Their presence was so strong that she was convinced that it was not just her imagination creating them. She became convinced that there is another reality parallel to the physical one with which we are more familiar. Since that time, she has had a strong belief in a spiritual reality. It is this that she feels has sustained her through her loss. Since Kamala's death, Cheryl has worked at the center as a volunteer, a facilitator, and a staff person. She is currently director of family services and home and uh, hospital visitations. She has been uh, intimately involved with many, many people, both children and adults, during their dying process. To the families and friends of these people, Cheryl has been a wonderful role model. Being a person who has gone through perhaps what uh, to most of us uh, was one of the worst pains one could uh, one can experience. It is. The death of both her children. The people she has helped can look at her and know that here is a person who has suffered this pain and has come out the other side functionally functioning fully with peace and hope in her heart. When we asked Cheryl what she felt was most helpful to her when she was working with people who were dying, she said, sorry, it's making me tear up. I can't, I mean, I can't even imagine how she, how they must have felt. I mean... If I lost Avea, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, and Avea doesn't even like me. <laughs> but to lose a child, there is, there is no more painful thing in the world for a parent than losing a child. It's, that's just, that's something no, no parent should have to deal with. No parent should have to feel. I'm sorry. What the heck? My, my neck alarm was going off for, um, for my insulin and it wouldn't let me in to shut it off. Weird. Um, but anyway, um, back to the book. I apologize. Um, it's just a reminder to, to take my insulin. Um, I'll take it after the video. Um, anyway, um, Where was I? When we asked Cheryl what she felt 
was most helpful to her when she was working with people who were dying. She said, to know that I am most helpful when I am not afraid. It is being with the person uh, when I'm free to share my peace, unconditional love, and acceptance. Often it is letting them know that there is no right or wrong way to die and that uh, how they are doing it is perfect because we all do it perfectly. It is a willingness to be there, to listen, to help them process their unfinished business. It is knowing that giving and receiving are the same. Most important, it is a willingness to see their light, which in turn reminds me to see my own. Wow. To lose both of her children and still be able to be an inspiration to others. Wow. That's, that's impressive. That is a beautiful soul right there. Alrighty. I think I'm going to take a drink real quick. Yes, my cup does say Taco Bell on it. I love Taco Bell. Alrighty. Sharon Pear Taylor. Sharon is the Director of Adult Program Services and has been a valued member of our program since she came to the center a few years after it opened. In working with both adults and children, Sharon feels it is important to be completely present in order to tune in to what you can think, say, or do to be helpful. She said, I think the most helpful attitude for me is uh, to have is one of not intruding on the other person's privacy. There are many times when the persons you are with may invite you to help them explore their inner thoughts and their unfinished business. This is a most precious time when both of you can experience oneness and joining in a way that is beyond words. Sharon emphasized how important it is to be completely honest at all times and to not disguise our thought, thoughts and feelings. Perhaps what most impressed us was the following. It is clear to me that we do not know what is best for another person. In our workshops, we try to remind people that we are not there to try to shape how another person should die. We are there to create an environment of unconditional love so that there is freedom to talk about any subject or not talk at all. She went on to say that the experiences I have had are rich beyond words. In working at the center, I continue to learn more about life death issues and to recognize that we are all students. The heck? That was weird. I swear I just heard a voice coming from the other side of my living room. There are no humans in my house but me. Very strange. Anyway. Learn more about life death issues and to recognize that we are all students and teachers to each other. My own spiritual journey has been enhanced by witnessing the spiritual transformation that has taken place in so many people that we have come to know. Meg Harmon. Meg Harmon is another dedicated staff member at the center and uh, as the director of loss and grief services, she has had the opportunity to be with many people who are facing death. Although Megan's, uh, Meg's uh, Baptist background taught her that life is eternal, 
that was not a belief she had ever been able to fully accept. Meg's experiences, like those of many others at the center, changed her way of thinking about love and the passing of the physical body. Her own mother's death allowed her to get more fully in touch with that part of herself that is neither the physical body nor the ego. Her story is important because of the particularly poignant way she describes how this realization unfolded in her life. At the end of her mother's life, Meg realized that the only thing that was really important to her, the mother, uh, was the love she had given and received from others. Meg goes on to say, What I realized in a very profound way that I never had before was that love is the most important healing force in the world. This event changed my life because I realized that my priority was to heal myself through the love that is in my own heart. Exactly. I started letting go of self-judgment and began to make the experience of sharing love the most important thing in my life. Meg's commitment to a spiritual path has only deepened since she came to the center. When I asked her to describe an, another peak experience, she described the time she spent with Paul Dearborn, a close friend whom she was with when he died of AIDS. They had sp spent many hours together as he approached death. Paul had not been able to talk that day so Meg spent the time with him in silence sorry there was something on my tongue it, it's weird um, Meg said I had an experience that allowed me to look past his body there was absolutely no question in my mind that we were both seeing the depth of each other's souls as we continued to join at a very deep level. The love we experienced had nothing to do with the body, and it was an experience that reminded me once again that since love, uh, that since love is eternal, it never dies. The body is just laid aside. Paul died a very peaceful death, and I was rewarded by my experience with him by con continuing to feel his presence in my life in a very real way. Let's see how much further I have to go. All right. I think this is the last testimonial. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. For so many people, it is their experiences around death that allow them to discover beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are much more than our physical bodies. Our fears of death can be very powerful. In fact, our egos often tell us that we must not think about death or allow ourselves to experience anything about it. One of the people whose work has been particularly helpful in guiding us beyond our egos false messages is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Her contribution has touched the lives of millions of people throughout the world, establishing her as the unchallenged leader in her field. For many years, Elizabeth has been not only a dear friend, but the brightest of light beams for us and the millions of others whose lives she has touched. Perhaps more than any other single person in our generation, she has helped to bring the subject of death out into the open. Her work has made it possible for those both in and out of the health professions to acknowledge their feelings about dying. Elizabeth has helped to create a way for all of us to explore 
who we really are. We recently interviewed Elizabeth for this book. She told us that her interest in the problems of dying started when she was six years old. I had pneumonia, she said, and I shared my room with another child. No one came in and talked with us about anything. We talked with each other a little, but most of our conversation occurred non-verbally. One night before we went to sleep, there were no words spoken between us. Yet I felt there was a uh, communication going on between our minds. As I look back on it, it was telepathic communication. She was telling me that she was going to die that night. When I woke up the next day, her bed was empty. She was gone. I later found out that she had indeed died. I felt her presence with me. And that day, I knew for sure that uh, we were more than... Uh, bodies. Elizabeth's workshops on death and the dying process emphasize the importance of experiencing uh, our feelings. She uh, states that many people come to the workshops who have suffered all kinds of abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual. Many of these people have found that being able to express themselves in a loving, supportive environment heals inner wounds that years of intellectual analysis have failed to heal. In our workshops, Elizabeth said it is truly experiencing all of the repressed emotions that is important. People can then make a decision to release them, to let go of them, and to no longer be attached to them. The light at the end of the tunnel then becomes brighter as we come closer to discovering who and what we really are. When we asked her if she had any pet formulas about what helped people uh, the most, she replied, I don't believe there are any cookbook recipes leading to a uh, recognition of our own spirituality. It is a long, hard process of going inside and of self-discovery. All right. So I'm going to stop there for now and pick this up hopefully later on this week on actual Saturday <laughs> um, and finish this chapter because we are almost done with chapter two. We are almost there. We're almost, we're, we're, we're almost to chapter three. One, two, three pages to chapter three. And I know it has been a very long wait to finish chapter two. I'm very sorry it took me so long to get back to it. But, uh, hey, at least I, f I finally got back to it, right? You know, at least I didn't, uh, I didn't stop reading the book. I didn't give up on it. Um, I think it's a very helpful, um, book. I think it's very, very good for, for mental health. Um, and I mean... When I first started reading it, I didn't know that it focused so much on life and death um, and illness. But to be perfectly honest, I think that it's very helpful um, that it that it does. Well, that's where those went. Okay. Alrighty. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> but, yeah, so, um... I'm, I'm really, I really think that it's very helpful for mental health and I want to keep reading it for mental health. I don't remember why I wanted to look in here. All right. So I'm sure you guys remember me buying this. Today is another day, is another chance to, to get better. You guys remember me buying this, right? For my cards, for my um, mental health, my um, self, my self care cards. Um, and I'm sure you guys remember me buying these. I need to clean this stuff. They need to be washed. 
And I'm sure you guys remember me buying these and reading these on this uh, on the, these episodes. I love this thing. Learn from uh, from yesterday. Live for today. Hope for tomorrow. This is my little card stand. You can see it to read it. So there's that. I'm gonna set her up. And as always, I will post a picture of the card that we draw today at the end of the video. Because I think it's nice for, not only for me to read it to you guys, but for you guys to be able to see it. So today's card is Small Progress is Progress. That's very helpful for me because I am always feeling like I am not doing enough in one day. Like no matter how much I clean, no matter how much I do, I'm just not doing enough. I love how they have like little kittens on them. Isn't that cute? My, my new deck, my square deck, has kitties and puppies on it. So that's cute too. Um, okay, the other side, it says 1% better every day. Think of a goal you've always wanted to accomplish. What is one small step you can do to get closer? Complete that step today and plan to do the next small step tomorrow. Do this daily. One step at a time. Alrighty. So, let's show that to you guys real quick. I don't know if you can see it to read it. But like I said, I'm going to post the pictures at the end of the video so you guys can can see them. Um, post pictures of both sides. Um, but anyway, I hope you guys like the video. Um, I'll put that right there. My little card stand. I hope you guys like my video. Um, and I hope, full, I hope that it's helped anybody who is dealing with grieving. Um, please like, share, and subscribe and have an absolutely beautiful day. And if no one, excuse me, I have been having the burps today. And if no one has told you today, you are enough. You are appreciated. You are loved. You are needed. And you are perfect absolutely the way you are. And don't let anyone tell you any different. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.